a safe place for all people to explore and restore their faith in Jesus. My name is Nicole. I'm one of the teaching pastors here, and I'd like to welcome the seven of you to Refuge tonight. I knew we were going to have a thin crowd tonight. Um, we have some people on vacation. My family even went to a concert without me. Don't worry. It was just George Strait. Not a big deal. Um, but my name is Nicole, and I would like to welcome you to Refuge tonight. I don't think we have any new people, but if you are new or you would like to stay in touch with the church and you're not getting texts or emails, you wouldn't have gotten one this week. I was um, elbow deep in children's tears, so I didn't have time to send out the email and text this week, so I apologize. But um, if you would like to receive those communications, um, you can either scan this QR code um, fill out a connect card and hand that to me tonight because um, they were crying because I hit them over the head with the red box they ripped off the wall. Um, so we don't have that. So if you want to fill out the card, hand it to me or send an email to info at refuge.church with your name and email um, and your phone number and uh, we can get you added to those lists. Um, if you would like to give to the ministry we're doing here at Refuge, we have a few ways to do that. Um, you can do that in person. There's a safe over here to my left, your right. You can drop it in person, cash checks credit cards, whatever you want to give to us to um, make the ministry happen. You can give online, which is my preferred way at refuge.church slash giving. You can give there. You can text. Um, you can text to give the numbers there on the screen. Um, and giving really makes what we do here possible. Yesterday, we were able to buy, what, 54 pairs of shoes? 54, 54. Well, we had a straggler pair that we don't know where it came from, but we were able to supply brand new shoes to kids, and um, that's only done through giving and support um, and generosity by the members of the church. So if you'd like to be a part of doing awesome things like that, those are the ways to do that. Um, I'm going to invite you to stand and pray, at, uh, pray us into our time of worship. Father, I am so thankful for the work you did this week through all of our volunteers, through the children's ministry here, and the lives that we touched as we shown Jesus' light. I pray that that your spirit would begin to just fill this room even though it's not a big crowd here tonight we're here to worship you we're here to seek you seek your face would you please have your way in this place tonight in jesus name i pray amen amen that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave this is the reason i sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason i sing
cross that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing for the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing. You are the reason I sing. Jesus, the reason I sing, you're the reason we sing. Father, you will never 
unchanging. I love you. One more time, church. I love you. I'm holding on to hope. I love you. In this last song, we just talked about how he is the anchor for our soul. This next song we're going to be singing is Oceans, because he calls us upon the water, and he is our anchor. We just have to focus on him and trust him. So I, during this song, I want you to really think about the lyrics and know that you're not alone, and we can look to him for guidance and protection. Presence of my shame. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer. I pray that we really mean when we call upon your name, that you'll be there. You'll keep our eyes above the waters. The, the first song we sang, you're the reason I sing. Because you help us. You are our hope, our perseverance. You give us joy. And I thank you for that. And I pray as Nicole comes up and preaches that we'll just take what she preaches and really apply it to our lives and really retain what she says. Thank you. Amen. You guys can have a seat and give your attention to the screen. So that was VBS. That's just a short little sampling of what VBS looked like this week. We played games. We learned about Jesus. We learned Bible verses-ish. Um, we learned that Zacchaeus, just so everybody knows, was a tax evader. Hmm? So that was a big day. And every time we asked, that's what they said. He was a tax evader. Um, but we went bowling. So, you know, there's a bowling alley back here. We walked all those kids to the bowling alley. We broke the bowling alley. We walked back. We had Southern Snowballs here. We had amazing athletes here. These kids ate a ton of food, a ton of food, a ton of snacks. We went through cases and cases of water. We went through, I think, almost 200 pounds of ice through the week because it's hot in case you guys didn't know. But the biggest thing is hopefully we planted seeds. Hopefully we planted seeds that for years to come, these kiddos will remember that somebody loved them. Even if it was for a week, we loved on them and we showed them how Jesus' light can shine everywhere. So biggest thing I want to say to everybody is thank you so much. So many people in this room, so many people out there, you guys donated money, you've donated your time, you made stuff. But man, the volunteers that worked in this building the past five days Thank you. Besides Nicole and I, if you take us out of the mix, the average age of our volunteer was 16 years old. And they gave up a week of their summer and they worked hard. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, don't go too far, Miss Tanya, because we have something we'd like to give to you. 
So um, in Bible, I was trying, you came in the room one day to keep a kid behaved, and I was like, no, I got to get him to sign a card. And so I kicked you out because we were, had the kids all uh, sign you cards and say thank yous for all that you did. So that's one thank you note. Um, the church also has a thank you. Uh, this is so hard for me to talk while also holding this. Um, Nicole's, that's a thank you from the church. Um, I don't know if you guys know, Tanya and Jeff put in so much work into this week, and I feel like we talk about it continuously, but behind the scenes, they've been working on this stuff for months. And Tanya was in the back with me with kids a couple weeks ago, and she was telling me how she was spray painting the huge solar system that you saw out front, it was literally sitting in their garage and they were like constantly working on it. Like it's, it's remarkable the amount of work that they put in to set this up. And we're just super grateful for you. Um, I didn't even know that this was the flower like that, <laughs> that they got. Um, plant nerd moment, you ready? Um, so this is, a, this is a succulent bunch, which it's funny to me because I, I, again, I didn't know that this is what they got. Um, succulents are actually um, a symbol of tenacity and selfless love. So if it's any flower arrangement to be presenting, I don't know if that was, that was even planned, but this is like the perfect representation of you and your husband. And we're just grateful um, for everything that you guys do. So yeah, give it up for them because they rock. All right. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Miss Tanya. And um, every kid that is with Miss Tanya tonight, you are free to go with her. Please be kind. Please be kind to her. <laughs> Look, <laughs> nobody else wanted to do it after. After. Oh no. Oh, I'm going to be stepping in that all night. All right. So anyways, VBS is over and I only have 358 more days until we have to do it again. This was my first year doing VBS with Refuge. I've done VBS in the past, but we've either done 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and like go home for lunch and sh sugar you up so that they are their parents' problems or seven or four to seven. Like I never had them for a full day quite like Tanya and Jeff uh, threw me into. And so that was, it was quite an experience. And um, so like as I'm, speaking and I have to just like keep reminding myself that I don't have to tell a room full of adults to sit crisscross applesauce or to catch a bubble or one, two, three eyes on me. Or if you hear me, touch your head, touch your nose, touch your butt. Um, yes, I really use that this week, but it was a week. It was fun. It was exciting. Um, and it was a week where we, like she said, we got to be Jesus. We got to shine the light of Jesus to kids who might not always encounter Jesus or might not always encounter peaceful situations. Not that VBS was always peaceful, but getting to be Jesus to kids who might not feel loved or valued or respected or seen, or they feel stress and anxiety in their normal day to day. It was just an awesome, t awesome thing to be a part of this week. And I was actually in charge of the Bible room, which is like the whole thing. Because without the Bible room, it's just vacation school. And it's just, you just come here and, and scream. And as if teaching the Bible isn't hard enough, um, I had kids aging from five to 13 years old. So they weren't all in there at the same time, but I had groups of three to six-year-olds come in and I had to like get them going, tell them to touch their butts to get them to pay attention to me. And then I had 12 and 13-year-olds who would have rather sneezed in my face than listened to me. Like it was just, it was, it was quite the task to try to make the Bible relevant because VBS gives you like these little cheesy books and things to follow along with little cheesy ways to keep the kid engaged. And like I said, for some of the littles, it was great. But some of the older kids, um, it was tough to get them to, to say, shine, Jesus is light. When I would say, when life feels dark, they would just kind of look at me. Um, but it was worth it to see some of the things stick. You know, like she said, like they kept saying uh, Zacchaeus was a tax evader, which I got to do a conversation with one of the groups like that might not necessarily be untrue. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, he wasn't a great guy, but um, seeing kids remember the Bible stories or, or even like uh, my little guy, I would drive home and ask him questions. And one day he, I was like, oh, so we shine Jesus's light, right? He's like, yeah, but I can't do that. And I was like, what? Why? And he's like, 
I don't have a flashlight. And <laughs> just like from the mouths of babes, it was so cute. Um, but I had this one young girl rotating through my room, um, and I ended up calling her the Riddler. Um, her real name is Jazara, but I called her the Riddler because um, she would ask me either invasive personal questions or deep theological questions. Like, if God isn't really real or have a real body, how does the Holy Spirit work? And I'm, I'm just like, like just trying to get her to say, can you just say shine Jesus' light for me? Just hold your tea candle like the rest of the kids and make donkey noises. Like, come on. Like, this is not what I signed up for. And so we're doing the story of Zacchaeus on day two. And, you know, I embellish a little bit because all good storytellers do. And I say he's the shortest man in the Bible. I really have no way to verify that. Um, and one of the kids called me up on it and called me out on it and said, how do you know he was the shortest man in the Bible? And before I could answer this kid, uh, the VBS Riddler goes, how do we know any of this is even true? <laughs> right? And immediately I have a second, a seven second faith crisis followed by a seven second panic attack because how do I answer this question? Because if you know me, you know, because the Bible said so isn't an answer that I like to give. But that's the easiest answer with kids is the Bible says so, so just shh and wave your candle and make donkey noises. Like that's, that's, that's how I, I felt. And so how do I address this question without dismissing her or, or hushing her or hush her doubting or her wonderings without making her feel stupid for asking a valid question? Because that's a valid question to ask. How do we know that any of this is even real or even true? And so while I was in my mini seven second faith crisis, I was like, is it true? Is it a lie? What's going on? I had a 14 existential, a second existential crisis in that moment. And so I simply say, look, it's a great question. Men and women have studied uh, this for thousands of years. They've done archaeology digs. They've looked for the proof so that we wouldn't have to. And I said, they, a lot of people smarter than me and smarter than you have figured it out. And I said, if one day you want to go to Starbucks, I'll tell you more. But for right now, wave your tea light and make a donkey noise. Just for the love of God, will you make a donkey noise? But I kept coming back to this question all week long is, how do we know any of this is even true? Because the, the story that we're talking to about tonight in our synoptic gospels is Jesus walking on water. And so next to his resurrection and raising people from the dead, this is probably one of the most unbelievable stories scripture has to offer, offer us. If people want to discredit the Christian faith and poke holes in our belief system, this seems like a pretty easy to start because we know in the year of our Lord, 2023, it is impossible to walk on water, but uh, not for baby Jesus. Do I have my baby Jesus picture in there? Maybe not. Maybe it fell. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still in VBS mode, so you're going to get some bad jokes, some, some, some kid-level humor there. And so we're talking um, about Jesus walking on water from the Gospel of Mark tonight. And Brian touched on some important port points about how Mark is actually written. It's fast-paced. It moves quickly. Uh, words like immediately and straight away, they convey the urgency and rapid movement of, his, of Mark's writing. It's short, straight, and to the point. And there are a couple themes in Mark. Two big themes. They're not the only two, but they are very important. Is one, the identity of Jesus. Mark identifies Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, and as King Jesus. And uh, the VBS Red Door asked me again, how can God and Joseph be Jesus' dad? And I was like, Lord, help me. And so Mark gradually reveals uh, Jesus' mission and his identity slowly and intentionally in an attempt to prevent misconceptions about the true nature of Jesus as the Messiah, because nobody expected a poor carpenter with no authority to be Messiah. They wanted a rich, powerful political leader. And so Mark is slowly revealing the identity of Jesus to show that he is the Messiah. The other theme we're going to touch on briefly tonight is the kingdom of God. Mark heavily emphasizes the kingdom of God in his portrayal of Jesus. Jesus's ministry on earth, because for Mark, Jesus's teachings and miracles um, demonstrate the power and presence of God's kingdom on earth. It wasn't just about an eternity we won't get to see. It wasn't just about heaven or this side of our life, but it was about bringing God's kingdom and love to earth. 
So before we get to Jesus walking on water, let's look briefly at what happens before he walks on water. We're in Mark chapter 6 tonight for a majority of our scriptures, and we're going to start in verse 35. And it says, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, there is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so um, they can go to the nearby farms and villages and get something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We have worked, we'd have to work months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Jesus said, how much bread do you have? Go find it. And then when they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to the heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up the 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish, and a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Now, coming off the tales of VBS, I wanted to preach um, from Jesus' point of view in Mark chapter 6, because this whole chapter, Jesus really goes through it. At first, he's rejected in his hometown. Then a friend of Jesus is executed. He's actually beheaded. John the Baptist was. He's tired. He's hungry. And people just want more and more and more of him. I wasn't originally supposed to preach tonight. I had planned on preaching right after VBS, so I really related to Jesus just wanting to eat dinner with my family and be left alone. So why are we talking about the, this miracle versus Jesus walking on water? So like I, I mentioned uh, just a second ago, Mark is dropping nuggets of Jesus' identity. He's setting the stage for a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. So when Jesus, Jesus multiplies this food, we get a small glimpse of his divine power. He, Mark is slowly pulling back the curtain to reveal Jesus as the Son of God when we get to verse 45. So immediately after this, so right after Jesus finished feeding 5,000 men and their family, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethesda while he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills to pray by himself. Jesus was like, look, VBS is over. You got your shoes. Now get out of my face. And so late that night, the disciples were in their boat in the middle of the lake and Jesus was alone on land. He saw that they were in a serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and waves. And it was about three o'clock in the morning. Jesus, so like if you're a parent or you've ever worked with kids or teenagers or stupid people, you know this moment well. Things are good. It's quiet. You're sipping your coffee or your big gulp margarita. Then you see or hear, or the hair on your neck, back of your neck starts to stand up, the water and the glass starts to ripple like in Jurassic Park, and you remember that these, tiny, that these tiny humans under your supervision cannot be left to their own devices. So Jesus looks out, he sees his disciple in the water, and three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in ter terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. And I love that line, he intended to go past them. He's been rejected in Nazareth. His friend has been ex executed. He's just trying to eat some lunch when a horde of 5,000 people and their families demand his attention. And then his disciples can't even do one thing. A thing that most of these men are pretty good at. They're fishermen. They know how to steer boats. They know how to fight winds and waves. And Jesus at three o'clock in the morning has to get up. Anybody ever, ever have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning because your child or your cat and your dog has just thrown up or something? And it's like, you, can you just do this one thing and sleep? And I think Jesus had a very introverted moment in trying to avoid a conversation with his disciples thinking, okay, these men are smart. They're fishermen. They know how to drive a boat. If they see me walking on water, they're going to know to follow me, right? Like if they see me just walking past their boat, they're going to know to come with me. But instead, they think he's a ghost. And then Jesus says this. He says, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then he climbed into the boat. 
and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed because they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. So how do we know any of this is even true? We're going back to the question the VBS Riddler asked. Like I said, this question lingered in my head and my heart all week leading up to preaching Jesus walking on water. Even as I was writing this message in between VBS rotations and movie day, I was asking myself, how do I know? Because when I was asked, I could not and would not say because the Bible said so. We know that I, I don't stand for that. I'm not here for that. That answer doesn't cut it for me. So this story being historically true is a complex and very hotly debated topic. See, its primary sources are Matthew and Mark, two of our synoptic gospels. And so you hear that and you think, okay, so the Bible says so, so it's got to be true. Right. So let's look at some things that we're looking for when we're talking about why is this story true. Is it true? We're looking at the validity, um, looking at some things that help validate and help lend to the truth of this story. And so I just want to, to let you know that this is me, this is not me telling you why this story is true. This is not me telling you, you have to believe it because of everything that I'm about to say. But I'm sharing with you some of the arguments and the ideas and the resources that I've used that, that lend to this event actually having happened. One of the key criteria that historians and scholars uses when studying um, the reliability of an event like this is multiple attestations. So the more people who wrote about it, like our synoptic authors, and the more they align in keys, key ways like synoptics do, while Matthew and Mark are two distinct sources, they are not direct copies, they have their own unique content, structure, and perspectives, which is why is part of the, so this is part of the Bible saying so, but lending to the reliability of Jesus actually walking on water because it was recorded by more than one person, it lends to that reliability. But that again is, well, the Bible is saying so. Another one that I like is a criterion for embarrassment. Basically meaning if that if something embarrassing happens in the story, it's more likely to be true. Because if someone looks like a doofus, it's probably true. So if you've heard any stories about me, they're probably true. Meaning I look like a doofus. Anyways, so look, there's like nine of you here. So just laugh at my bad dad jokes. It'll make me move quicker and we'll get out of here much quicker if you just laugh at my bad dad jokes. So when the gospel, uh, the other synoptic that this story is recorded in, the one David will take on next week, Peter also walks water. And if you've grown up in church or been around church long enough, you know that, that that's in the story that Peter also walks on water, but he seeks. So the inclusion of this potentially embarrassing detail could suggest to the reader that the gospel op- op- authors were not merely attempting to fabricate or glorify or idealize Jesus but that they're including real life stories, real mess ups, real, um, real mistakes by people. Peter is believed to be the main source for Mark's, Mark's gospel, so that could explain why he didn't put it in Mark. Another one that we look at is oral tradition, and this one is probably one of the more crucial ones. Before stories and teachings of Jesus were written down, they were transmitted orally through word of mouth, especially within Christian communities. Literacy was not a widespread among ancient communities. Reading was actually more of a rich man's luxury, so not everybody could read or write, so there weren't a thousand copies of the Bible. One of the tasks that the kid ha- kids had to do this week was run around the church and count how many Bibles were in the building, and it was part of a scavenger hunt. That was not the case for, for, um, for, uh, that was not the case in Jesus's time is that not everything was written down, not everything was recorded. So they relied a lot on passing things by word of mouth. Most of the fishermen on the boat had their stories to tell. And regarding this story, the presence of those eyewitnesses helped lend to the truth of the history of this event. If any disciples that were close to Jesus are on that boat in this time likely were eyewitnesses and their uh, retelling of the story was included in scripture. And it's hard for us to really wrap our mind around this idea, um, oral tradition. Um, We live in the age of information. We have Google and ChatGPT at our fingertips. And you know, the most reliable source, Facebook, to tell us things that we need to know. 
Because for us in the year 2023, oh, some people saw it and told some other people who told some other people who told a dude who knew how to write, wrote it down. Okay, sure, that's true. We know how to call out somebody's BS. See, if in one of my footnotes and one of my theological papers that I wrote for school looked like this, um, uh, if it looked, do I have that slide up there? If it just said that he said that one thing that pastor said that one time somewhere between the year 2012 and 2015, this would not fly as a reliable source for my theological papers. But we have to make some space in our thought processes and our understanding that this is how it was done. This is how stories were told. This is how we got scripture. This is how prophets' uh, prophets words made it into the 20th century is through oral tradition to pe until people were able to write it down and canonize it. Ancient Twitter was actually a bird. Facebook was actually words coming out of someone's face, and Instagram was cave paintings. That's just how they did it. Another piece to this puzzle, again, this is, these are pieces to a puzzle. I'm not telling you this because all of this is fact, and you have to believe every single word I say so that you know Jesus really did walk on water. I'm giving you pieces to a puzzle so that you can take it and figure it out for your own with this and every other story and every other sermon we preach here. But another piece of this puzzle is something called the adverse witness test. And instead, instead of trying to just merely explain it to you, I want to share a, a quote from Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. He's interviewing a theology professor, and this is part of that conversation. It says, this test, the adverse witness test, asks the question, were, other, were others present who would have contradicted or corrected the Gospels if they had been distorted or false? In other words, do we see examples of contemporaries of Jesus complaining that the gospel accounts were just plain wrong? Many people had reasons for wanting to discredit this movement and would have done so if they would have simply told history better. Yet look at what happens. Uh, look at what his opponents did say. In later Jewish writings, Jesus is called a sorcerer who led Israel astray which acknowledges that he really did work marvelous wonders, although the writers dispute the source of his power. This has been a perfect opportunity to say something like that. The Christians will tell you he worked miracles, but we're here, but we're here to tell you that he didn't. Yes, that's the one thing we never see his opponents saying. Instead, they implicitly acknowledge that what the gospel wrote is true, that Jesus performed miracles. Days, weeks, months, years, centuries after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the opposition could have shut it down, especially if none of it had happened. And again, I'm not trying to convince you why it is true with the short time I have with you, or simply say it's true because the Bible says so. I'm trying to give you the tools and the ability to figure these things out for yourself, because sometimes faith feels like a four-letter word. And faith is sometimes in short supply, but there is a way to figure it out for yourself. It's a never-ending journey. You'll never have all the answers. Certainty doesn't exist on this journey, so bear that in mind if you start, if you start, to, um, if you start down this road with us. So as I start to wind down here, I promise I'm getting um, to the close. We've looked at ways we can figure out if it's true or not. We can look at ways scholars and historians have dissected this story, have taken the story and, and, and helped it get to where it is in the canon of scripture and, and believing that it's true. But let's look at um, why it's important. I want to talk about why it's important that Jesus walked on water. If we put this miracle up against Jesus' other miracles, it's a little bit different. Some of other Jesus' miracles include the one we talked about earlier is that he feeds 5,000 plus hungry people. He shows them love and kindness and compassion by meeting a very real practical need. He heals and forgives the paralyzed man like we talked about last week. He forgives him of his sins, showing love and grace and showing that he cares for the outcome of people's lives. He heals lepers, showing that his concern for, his concern for the well-being of his people. He turns water into wine. Now, this not, might not feel like a miracle for other people, but after a week of VBS, he's like, you know what? You need it. 
Walking on water doesn't really seem to be benefiting anybody or so that it seems. More so, what this miracle is about is God's self-revelation through Jesus Christ, showing us who he is. Like we talked about, one of the themes in Mark is slowly pulling back the curtain so we can slowly but surely see the identity of Jesus, see who he is, that he has God, fully God and fully man. And in this miracle, he defies the law of nature. The miracle of Jesus walking on water defies everything we know about physics and the natural order of things. It goes beyond the boundaries of human understanding and showcases the authority that Jesus has over creation. This event reveals that Jesus is not limited by the physical laws that govern our world, and it emphasizes his divine nature, like I said, fully God and fully man. And this is also something God did. God showed his people in the Old Testament his power over nature. Exodus 14, 21 through 22 said, Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all night, turning the seabed into dry land, so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. Just like in the Old Testament when God manipulated water to deliver his people, so Jesus is walking on water and manipulating water to bring deliverance. And that's the other thing that Jesus does as he's walking on water. We see it when Jesus steps into the boat, boat and he helps his disciples. And we saw it with the children of Israel after he parts the water. Not only did God part the water in the Old Testament and give them a path to walk through. In Exodus 14, 24, before dawn before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. So not only did they have an escape route, but Jesus, through manipulating nature, through using his authority over the created world, he throws the Egyptian army into confusion and delivers the children of Israel from their grasp. Let's reread Mark six fifty. But Jesus spoke to them at once. He said, do not be afraid, take courage, I am here. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and, he, and this says, I am here, but most other translations say, it is I. And this is important because the Greek here translates the same way the Hebrew from Exodus does when Jesus says, I am. Exodus 3.14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am sent me to you. In John 8, 58, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. Jesus was claiming divine identity. He was equating himself with the eternal and self-existent God of the Old Testament. By using the phrase, I am here, or it is I, Jesus was declaring himself to be the same God who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, the same God who parted the Red Seas, the same God who delivered the children of Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus consistently reveals his divine nature and his authority, showing that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and the embodiment of God's presence among his people. Exodus 33, 19 through 23 says this, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will call out my name Yahweh before you for I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face for no one may see me and live. The Lord continue, look, stand near me on this rock as my glorious presence passes by. I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. I'm going to invite the band to come back up as I close. Moses is seeking in this in this passage of scripture I just read you from Exodus. He's God is speaking to Moses and Moses is seeking reassurance and a deeper understanding of God's nature. 
He actually asks God to see God's glory. He says, show me your glory. I want to see you. Moses wants to know God intimately. He wants to experience the presence of God. And in response to Moses' request, God agrees to reveal himself to Moses, but with a caveat. God says, you cannot see my face. Instead, God tells Moses he will pass by him and Moses will see his back. And this shows us that God is incomprehensible. God's glory is so overwhelming and awe-inspiring that we as mortal humans cannot fully comprehend it or see it directly. And God desires intimacy with his people. Despite not being able to see God's face, Moses is granted the unique experience of experiencing the presence of God. God's willingness to pass by Moses and reveal just a glimpse of his glory shows us that he has grace for his people, that he desires to be in relationship with his people. And I read this passage to you because the very same language that's used in Exodus, speaking of God's glory passing by, is the same language used when Jesus, when, it, when Mark writes about Jesus intending to just pass by his disciples. Now, I can make a really funny joke about how Jesus was sick of their stuff and just wanted to keep trucking by them and let them figure it out on their own. But there, what happens is so important. That is, Jesus defies the law of nature, and he demonstrates his authority over creation. He also shows that he wants to be in relationship with his people, that in God is unreachable. God is unattainable. His caveat is you cannot see all of me. You cannot have all of me. You cannot experience all of my presence. You don't get to see my face. But with Jesus, fully God, fully man, the creation of God on earth to be with his people. When Jesus stepped onto that water, it was as good as tearing the veil. When Jesus stepped into that water, we no longer had a caveat. We no longer got just a glimpse, but we got all of Jesus. Because while Jesus just intended to pass by and, and give a glimpse of his glory to his disciples, he instead decided to give all of himself to his disciples in that moment and step in to the boats. We no longer have to be satisfied with just a glimpse, but we get to experience all of Jesus. And not just as he passes by, but as he sits with us, as he comes into this room, as we get to experience the advocate, the helper, and the Holy Spirit. The relationship that Moses desired with God is now on offer to all people. And this is the light of Jesus that I want to shine. That was our theme all week long at VBS is, is we shine Jesus' light. Uh, on the first day, it was when life feels dark, we shine Jesus' light. When people don't get along, we shine Jesus' light. When good things happen, we shine Jesus' light. When people are sad, we shine Jesus' light. And that is the kind of Jesus that I want to be to a world is I do not want to put up barriers or be a gatekeeper for the presence of God. I will not put up walls, but I want to make my table longer because Jesus' presence on earth, Jesus' presence on the water shows us that he desires to be in relationship with us, whatever that looks like for us, wherever we are in our journey, whatever questions we have, whatever doubts we have as we're exploring and restoring our faith, Jesus desires intimacy with us. I'm gonna ask you to stand and close your eyes as I pray us in to our, our final time of worship. And I just pray tonight that you would experience Jesus because he's not just passing us by tonight. But the Jesus we're singing to, the Jesus we're worshiping, is he's getting into our boat, that he's standing right there with us. And we don't have to be satisfied with just a glimpse. We don't have to be satisfied with just seeing the back of Jesus, but we get to experience all of Jesus. So Father, would you invade this place tonight, God? Holy Spirit, would you step into our boats where we are? If we're doubting, if we're questioning, if we're still wondering if these things are true, 
or if our faith has been strengthened and we are holding on to you with all we've got, would you just allow us to experience you tonight? Allow us to experience you so that we can reflect your light to all people. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I will love 
again. anxious, we're overwhelmed, we're sad, we can look to you, we can cry out your name, because you reign. I thank you that we can sing hallelujah, our God reigns. Like, that's just so amazing. Like Nicole said earlier, you want an intimate relationship with us. You care for us, and we can look to you for guidance, and I thank you for that. touch your nose. Can you hear me touch your butt? All right. I love you guys so much. Thank you for being here. Um, look, uh, if you have questions or have things you want to talk about, things that you're unsure of, anything I talked about, I am available um, most, most times during the day and would love to take you to coffee and talk about some of this stuff with you. If you want resources, email me at info or Nicole um, at refuge.church and I'd be happy to give you those resources. I love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.